so many great questions so far through the banana stand. Um, just as a reminder that um, if you could please have your mic turned off and if you're um, comfortable, please turn your video on so you guys can see each other. And just so we're not really talking to a blank audience, it's kind of <laughs> kind of lonely, you know. <laughs> um, other than that, um, also feel free to send some questions into our chat where we will be answering these questions at the very end of the event. So we can always continue to answer these questions. All right. All right, so this event will be a very relaxed session where Matt, Connor and I, along with our amazing panel of leaders, will be answering questions you have asked throughout the week, along with a variety of questions that previous students have asked that we think are useful and relevant to you. So without further ado, let's get started. So one of the first questions that we've gotten that's um, fairly, it's fairly generic, but it's also a really relevant question, which would be, what is a course syllabus? So a course syllabus is basically the golden ticket for every single course that you take in university. It's kind of like an abstract to a journal article where this document indicates the professor's contact information, uh, the grade breakdown of the course, um, different types of topics, um, a list of assignments, tests, and exams that are occurring, as well as any required readings or textbooks for the course. All policies that apply to this course are also specified within the syllabus. Um, so please read it really carefully during the first week of classes so you really understand what you're going to be learning in the course. Another question we've been seeing a lot is how do exams work? So you Waterloo exams are weighted heavier than likely what your high school finals would have been weighted. So these examinations can accumulate from 20% to 100% of your final grade. And that will depend greatly on the course and the program that you're in. The structure and formatting of the final will all depend on the teaching style of the professor, especially going into an online semester, um, like we are right now. So some, pro some professors may conduct an online final exam within the designated exam period in December with a specified duration and time when you have to write the exam, while others may assign a take home exam so if you're looking to find out what your courses are going to be like, the best place to look is to check the course syllabus for each class. Um, another one uh, that we've got is uh, what's the difference between a teaching assistant or a TA and the professor? So uh, usually in larger classes, the professors instruct the lecture components of the course. Uh, they also hold office hours on a weekly basis where you can ask questions about assignments and course material. Uh, this will allow you to make a connection to the professor as well. Uh, in some cases with very small class uh, sizes, for example, with classes less than around 15 people, uh, the professor may not have any teaching assistance for the course, but a teaching assistant typically facil facilitates the lab and tutorial components of the course. Uh, they're also usually assigned to marking any assignments. So if you have any specific questions about assignments, teaching assistants are there to help you understand the assignment guidelines and provide feedback. Perfect. And then so another question is regarding like the fact that, oh, maybe I'm beginning to fall behind in my classes. Um, how do I get back on track to make sure I'm always going to be successful? Um, so one thing is don't worry, don't panic. Um, but first seek guidance from your academic advisor and explain your situation thoroughly so they're uh, able to help identify the problem. But in situations where you maybe have already identified that problem, um, figure out some ways to mitigate feeling are falling um, further behind. Um, so all students will feel overwhelmed and overloaded at times. So it's completely normal to feel this way. Um, so please don't panic and don't stress. Um, remember that um, you gotta make time for self-care and um, exercises to ensure that you're staying healthy and happy throughout your time in university. Um, so you're always gonna be producing the best quality and the best, um, uh, best work possible. Um, another way that you can also um, make sure that you're not falling behind is always contact um, the professor or the teaching assistant because um, they're the best people that um, know about the course. They know the course content the best and they're definitely understanding and more than happy to help out. So building off of that question, the next question is I am feeling burnt 
burnt out and unmotivated. How do I cope with the feeling? So I'm sure we've all experienced that at some point in our university careers. And there are lots of great resources at the University of Waterloo to help you out. For example, there's MATES, which is peer-to-peer um, mentoring, as well as counseling services you can go to if you're feeling homesick or lonely or just stressed and you need someone to talk to. That's a great resource on campus. Um, additionally, personally, I like to go and work out when I'm feeling burnt out and need to release some stress. So you can check out SIF or PAC, or there's a lot of great um, online workouts as well that the athletics department is running. And of course, if you're living in residence, your Don is a great person to reach out to if you're looking for some support. <clears throat> All right. Um... There's just a question in the chat. Where can we check the course syllabus? Uh, so the course syllabus will be available to you on Learn on the first day of class. Um, so you can go on there. You can go to the specific course uh, on Learn, and there should be um, a syllabus or something of the sort uploaded. Uh, the big question is, how are we going to learn? Yeah. Well, if <laughs> you're going to learn online. Um, but um, sorry, the checking the course syllabus, uh, it would be uploaded on Learn on the first day of class once that's available uh, to you. Uh, and then the next question that we have here is how will I receive my class schedule? Um, the, your class schedule will be uh, available on Quest. So if uh, you haven't um, used Quest yet, you can go to the website. I think it's quest.uwaterloo.ca or something like that. Um, you can go on there, log in um, with your uh, what I am, which is that sort of shortened version of your name and your password, and then you can um, view your class schedule there. You can view your finances on that platform. You can view uh, lots of uh, different stuff on Quest. And then everybody's probably wondering with uh, the shift to the online format, um, how will we make friends? How will you, you create those connections, those bonds? Um, and this is a really good one where um, you're going to still have to use social media to connect with people. So hopefully through um, orientation, you've connected with some people in your program. Um, I know um, various student societies, such as the Environment Student Society, or we like to say ESS, or um, there's Planning Students Association, which is um, the Planners Student Association, or PSA, um, that hosts events throughout the term. Um, there's also faculty-wide events held by the University of Waterloo's Faculty of Environment, where you can network with people, as well as kind of have um, some social aspects. Um, so there's a variety of events uh, within our faculty, um, as well as uh, across the campus, or the virtual campus, uh, where you can create those friends, create those connections with others. Amazing. So how can I customize my degree? So this will depend a lot on what program you're in and how many electives you have and also what your interests are. So a lot of programs are really flexible and they will let you take minors or specializations from across the university. So, for example, I'm in knowledge integration and I'm taking a minor in anthropology under the arts faculty. So there are lots of different ways for you to explore your interests and figure out what you're passionate about and add those onto your degree are looking for more information on this your academic advisor will be your best resource all right um what clubs activities and societies are running right now so um specifically for clubs there's so many clubs on campus so i personally am unaware of what's running and what's not uh usually there's a clubs day pretty early on in the term um, which I would hope, uh, because of the circumstance, we would have a clubs day online where you can learn about different clubs that are running in a virtual setting, um, or in maybe a socially distanced setting. Um, and then activities on campus. So, uh, again, I'm unaware of what buildings are going to be open exactly and what's not. Um, but for societies running right now, as Connor mentioned before, uh, there's planning student society, there's a student society for sort of each uh, environment program. So those will, will be running in uh, a virtual sort of capacity to uh, um, allow you to attend events and uh, meet other first years. 
Uh, I'm just seeing a bunch of questions in the chat about schedules, so I'm just going to share my understanding of the breakdown here. Um, if you're so all environment and classes are online, um, your schedule should be available in Quest. If um, you can't see anything on your schedule, my understanding is that um, your classes are sort of being just posted on Learn, and it's sort of a go at your speed sort of thing. If you have a time slot scheduled in Quest, so somebody said earlier, I only have one tutorial posted on my schedule. That tutorial has a time slot, and that's like a we're scheduled to meet at 11:30 a.m. to 12:50 a.m. for our tutorial, and that's going to be on WebEx, and that's a scheduled uh -huh. meeting time. Anything else that's not available on Quest, either the the time slot isn't decided yet, or it's sort of a our content's being posted on Learn weekly, and you'll just be going through it uh, at your own pace. Just to build off of that, um, if they don't have any schedule, essentially, you should just still continue to re reference that course syllabus to confirm um, the office hours and just uh, how we're going to access the lecture content um, to those um, different courses. Um, and then kind of building off of the clubs and societies and act different activities that are running on campus. Um, if you're a student living in residence or even in um, the Waterloo region this term, um, what buildings are open? on campus uh, this term. So um, the Student Life Center will be open. Um, it will be open from 7.30 a.m. to 7 p.m., um, seven days a week. Um, there's also some buildings, uh, residence buildings, that will be open for residents to study in. So Claudette Miller Hall, for instance, has their um, kitchen open as well as a study space in the main foyer, open in a socially distant manner. Um, there is the South Campus Hall or SCH that's open for um, the W store and the bookstore in a socially distant manner. Um, and that's about it that I can remember. Um, I believe the physical activities complexes and our um, gyms will not be open at this time. Um, yeah. Okay, so next question. I am struggling with writing quality. Who can I go to and what services are available? So we actually have a service um, at the University of Waterloo called the Writing Center. So you can go there for a drop-in appointment to get someone to read over your paper or for advice on a lab, um, anything you need help with writing. You can also book an appointment ahead of time if you would like more help, so a longer session. They're a great place to go to. Um, I also want to just correct my answer from last time. Um, so the pack gyms will be open and um, the swimming pools will be open upon appointment only. So you would have to go online to book an appointment to go to the gym or the pool. Sorry about that. Uh, there's just more in chat about um, lectures and learn and stuff. So um, will the lectures and work that we are expected to be doing be uploaded on a learn weekly or all at once? Uh, that's up to the professor, so if they have a scheduled meeting time, then they would probably have either PowerPoint or lecture slides uploaded beforehand, and then the lecture take place at the scheduled meeting time. Um, what do we do on day one? Do we just log on to learn slash quest? On the first day, I would log in to learn. Um, that is where your syllabus would be located, so if you need information on uh, contact for your professor or teaching assistants, or your um, or information on office hours. Um, that'll be available to you on the first day of class. Where will we access lectures and our syllabus? Again, that'll be on Learn. Uh, if one of you guys who are volunteering wants to link that again, just for the people in chat, that'd be great. Thanks, Graham. And Connor, I'm just going to pawn this question off to you, if that's OK. I know you're super familiar with services on campus, so. Yeah, no worries. All right, so the next question is, I'm struggling with writing quality and um, 
who can I go to and what services are available on campus? I think, I think um, Lindsay so, did that one. Oh, that I think one? we're on oh, the next wait. one, yeah. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Is That's this okay. one? Yep. Okay, here we are. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Um, so I'm struggling, struggling with anxiety, stress, or mental health. Um, who can I contact? Um, so basically there's a lot of um, different peer-to-peer -peer, uh, support systems such as mates. Um, if you're a part of the LGBTQ community and are you looking for someone to talk to, there's GLOW, the GLOW Center. Um, there's counseling services um, that you, you can uh, book an appointment um, virtually. Um, I'm not 100% sure if you're able to book an in-person appointment yet, but there are definitely services available to you. Um, as well as um, if you're struggling with um, anxiety about um, some sort of accessibility concerns when moving to the online um, environment, there is um, accessibility services that are definitely available to help you. Um, so um, all these services are available on the uwaterloo.ca um, website. So I definitely go check them out and um, uh, contact someone that is on that website to make sure that they are um, answering the correct questions. All right, next we have uh, what health related services are available on campus this fall. So uh, it's my understanding that the health services building will be available to you uh, in the fall. Um, this is where you can go if you have any uh, need to see um, a doctor, if you're feeling sick, unwell for, or, uh, for any reason, you need a checkup or something like that. Uh, you can call the health services building. I'm not sure exactly what the phone number is, but uh, you can call them and schedule an appointment and uh, and go there for any health related services you need. Awesome. So next question. I have not experienced the Canadian fall or winter before. How can I prepare? So in the fall, temperatures are usually between 5 to 20 degrees Celsius, so it can vary a lot <laughs> depending on the year, depending on the day. And then during the winter, temperatures can reach as low as minus 30 degrees Celsius with lots of snow. So we highly recommend that you have proper boots, winter jackets, mittens, and toques um, available to you for you to ensure you properly maintain your health when it gets cold. All right, and then another question is, um, what is a WUSA? Or you might have heard this acronym, WUSA. Um, it's actually, uh, it's a long thing that says it's your Waterloo Undergraduate Student Association. So instead of saying that big mouthful, we say WUSA. And that's our student society for the entire university. Um, so basically, um, all first years um, within the faculty and across the university will be receiving a WUSA kit. They'll be receiving an orientation box and that's um, on behalf of them welcoming everybody to university. So there's a lot of swag items and information about university. Hopefully that will be um, given to you guys um, in the next week or so or shipped out. Um, if you're in residence, you should have received one um, when checking in. Um, but yeah, so that was from your Waterloo Undergraduate Student Association. It provides a lot of different services and clubs and um, stuff for you to get um, involved in on campus and within the Waterloo community. Awesome. Um, next we have, what is the ESS? Uh, the ESS is the Faculty of Environments Student Association, more formally known as the Environment Student Society. So they host a variety of services, events, and opportunities to meet and mingle with other students within the faculty. Uh, some virtual events may include uh, live streams, photo contests, while other events are uh, in the ESS, the ES coffee shop located in EV1144. Amazing. So the next question is, how can I get more involved in the university community? So there are lots and lots of ways to get involved in the university community. 
one of the best ways to do that is to join a club or get involved with your program. All programs in the faculty environment have a student society, so they run lots of great events throughout the semester that you can attend to get to know people in your program um, in the upper years as well. Additionally, WUSA has over 200 clubs that you can join. So if you're everything from anime to photography club to there's even a cheese club, which I actually joined in first year, it was a lot of fun. Um, so you can get involved and meet lots of people that way. All right, so another question is um, that's very relevant to uh, co-op students is what is the system called Waterloo Works? So Waterloo Works is a job finding software that allows co-op students to browse um, tons and tons of jobs ac across a variety of range of program areas and um, uh, different types of disciplines where you can um, find your co-op placement. Um, different um, programs have a, a different amount of co-op placements that you need to um, fulfill to in order to graduate on time with your graduating class. Um, and along with this, you would have to um, take a professional development component, uh, component um, to the work term. Um, within uh, Waterloo Works, what you'll see is you'll see um, um, you would have to upload your resume, your cover letter, any different specified documents like that and then you would um, apply to jobs. Um, they all have due dates. Um, there's a ranking process and all that, which will be explained within your first professional development course called PD1. Um, another thing is, is that if you have, I've seen that in the chat, there's a lot of questions about the, your WUSA boxes. Um, I would like to direct you to um, uh, at your WUSA on um, Instagram. Um, there is a frequently asked questions document in their bio, and if you have any um, further questions, they'd be happy to uh, answer a direct message from you guys. Um, you can keep the ball rolling on the co-op stuff, Connor, if you want. Yeah, that, that, I was just about to say, yeah, I will yeah. definitely do that. Um, so. <laughs> Um, say if you're in an um, instance where you're in a co-op program and you're scheduled for a work term in the winter, um, a lot of people in the chat have been asking and at the banana stand have been asking, uh, how do I start preparing? Um, what will it look like transitioning into an online environment? Um, so I've recently just um, came off of uh, using the Waterloo work system for transitioning into a co-op for this term. Um, so all the interviews that uh, I experienced were all scheduled remotely. Um, so they were either through phone interviews or webcam interviews used through various Zoom links or Microsoft Teams. It all depends on the employer, how they want to contact you. So first off, um, to begin preparing for your work term, I definitely, you should see that you're enrolled in professional development course one, um, which is um, offered by the Center for Career Action or known as the CCA. Um, this course will help prepare you um, by establishing your resume, your cover letter, and uh, learning about that Waterloo system, our Waterloo work system, like I said before. Um, another thing I would suggest is um, don't rely heavily on Waterloo works because you never know um, what types of jobs are available on LinkedIn or on um, um, all different types of job finding software because my first um, really cool job that I took on my off term was through um, indeed.com. So um, you never know um, where you can find a really cool job and um, an employer that's um, that suits your needs and all that sort of stuff. So I definitely make sure you're considering all your options and all like that. Awesome. Okay. Um, that was our sort of um, <clears throat> FAQ. Um, we're going to jump to our questions that we've seen come up um, quite often at our banana stand. And then questions from the chat are also being sort of copied and pasted over to us. So um, if you've been posting in the chat and we missed it, we will get to it at some point in this, uh, this next uh, section here. So at the top, we have co-op questions. I don't know if you want to just keep rolling, Connor. <laughs> um, 
there we go. I'm off mute now. Okay. <laughs> I'll definitely um, keep doing this. So um, one question is, can I take courses during my co-op term? 100% you can. Um, so generally, um, you can only enroll up to one additional course while you're on your co-op term, because generally those um, co-ops are roughly a full-time job. So they want to make sure that you're putting in uh, full-time hours and you're making sure that you're completely focused on the job and not studying abroad or studying remotely or um, on campus. Um, if you would like to take two courses, um, that is an option, but you have to make sure that you have um, the employer's consent as well as uh, approval from your academic advisor. So again, with the academic advisor, just definitely keep in touch with them. They're like your best friend. They help you with a lot of things for, uh, throughout your degree. Um, get to know them because they're amazing people. Um, I believe I saw another one in the chat. It was, um, what is your experience of getting your first co-op job like? Um, so mine was a bit unique because when I began for planners, they begin their co-op after their second year, second semester or 2B term. Um, and when I was going into my um, first co-op, I had to end it a month and a half early because I was going on an exchange to Australia. Um, so what I would do is I'd apply to a lot of jobs. And um, when I uh, got an interview, um, this can go with any extenuating circumstance, um, but I would have to be um, upfront with the employer saying, hey, I have to leave um, a month and a half early and um, either just say just to let them know as a proper method of communication. Um, and they would either um, say, oh, OK, that's that, that works with us or sorry, you're not hired. So um, that was how I had to um, get my first co-op job. Um, fortunately, it worked out. I was able to get one through the first round. Um, but basically, the way the whole entire co-op process works is that you first begin to apply to jobs, which is a two-week period. You have uh, roughly about a month of interviews. And then after all those interviews are completed, you create, um, you get, receive all of your rankings from the employers. So employers have the ability to rank you from um, offering you the job or number one to all the way to 10th position. Um, they don't have to fill out those entire 10 slots. They don't have to select any candidates at all. So they, they could even go with another school's um, candidate. Um, but basically, when you receive your rankings, you either see um, a number one, which means you got the job, or a ranked, which means you could, could have gotten second all the way through 10th. Um, so this becomes a strategy, um, especially if you haven't received an offer on Waterloo Works. Um, and this strategy will definitely be, um, um, will be discussed through, um, uh, different, um, CC or CCA, um, appointments, um, workshops, events, as well as through, um, professional development one. So for non-co-op students, you can also use Waterloo Works. Um, and I would highly recommend checking out the Career Center for the CCA if you're not in co-op as well. They run lots of great programming, including resume critiques, um, interview, <laughs> interview tips, and all of that. So they're a great resource to check out if you're, even if you're not in co-op. Okay, oh, I'm on mute. Jeez Louise. I can't mute, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Can you hear me? Am I still muted? You I'm are not... unmuted. Oh my You're god, okay, sorry, my, my team is weird. We have we had a question in the chat I, I think we should answer um about uh watt cards and if necessary to all for all students to have one, what is it? Uh, how do you get one and, and what do you use it for? So maybe, maybe Matt, you want to take that one for us? Sure, yeah. So uh, your walk card is sort of like your, it's your student ID. Um, if you're familiar with that from, you know, any other uh, university. Um, you can, in a traditional term, you could load money on it. You can use it uh, for 
um, different sort of places to eat around campus, or you can use it for um, different services on campus as well. So like if you need to print something on a printer on campus, you use your walk card. Um, it's also your bus pass in a traditional um, in-person term. So you would use it to get around um, using the bus. Um, if you're living at home during your first semester, um, I would say it would depend where you're at. So if you're on the other side of the world, maybe you don't necessarily need your Watt card if you're familiar with your student number um, and that um, that sort of stuff. But if you're in the city, like near Waterloo and you're um, living at home, maybe it's worth getting the Watt card so then you can um, have your bus pass. And if you, um, as mentioned before, you know, the um, the gyms are available by appointment and stuff like that, so you can use it to uh, enter those facilities. That's a good question, though. Thanks. OK, uh, I think we could keep it moving. We'll answer some of those other Wattcard questions uh, a bit later. Um, in terms, there's a couple of questions I'm seeing that we've had uh, pretty frequently about uh, courses and and learn and Kind of this the asynchronous synchronous kind of style so maybe maybe lindsay could i get you to, to talk a bit about um how and the difference between asynchronous and synchronous uh programming and and maybe how often students should be checking learn um and maybe what they expect they should expect to, to find uh within those each each class page definitely so i can actually speak to my personal experience this semester so on Quest, as many of you were saying earlier, your schedule may look blank. That's exactly how mine looks as well. So that means that I have no synchronous classes scheduled on Quest. Now, on September 8th, when Learn opens, all of your classes will be listed there. So you can go and click on your class. And then from there, you'll be able to find the course syllabus for each class. And as we were talking about earlier, those are a great resource. So your professor will have it clearly explained what they expect from you what parts of the course will be asynchronous, which means done at your own pace um, or not at a scheduled time, and which parts will be synchronous. So for example, one of my professors actually emailed me last week saying that he wants to schedule a synchronous time. So that was how he let us know. So if your professor hasn't emailed you yet, don't worry. You can find all, all of that information on Learn on September 8th when that opens. Nice. Uh, we have another question here um, uh, about um, grade expectations from the difference between high school and university. Some people say a true grade will drop by 10% from high school. Um, maybe, maybe Connor, you can talk a bit about different expectations in terms of, of work quality or 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 kind of like the, the distribution of, of how your grades might look in, in first year compared to high school? Yeah, for sure. So when you're looking at high school grades, um, there, there's not usually a lot of weight towards uh, their final exams where they would be up to 30% on a good day, sometimes maybe 10% or not even ex an exam at all, where there's in-class tests and assignments that are more heavily based. Um, in university, it's usually um, there's a lot more um, uh, weighted opportunities and it's on these tests and these final um, examinations. Um, there are some lab components or essay components, which are submitted usually at the end of the term. Um, and generally uh, work quality is um, very important. It's um, best to, it's the most, um, sorry, what I would say is that it's it's the um, you have to make sure that you're submitting the most uh, professional and um, academically ple um, academically pleasing uh, quality of work by all times. For sure, I think that's definitely important. I, to, and then they said that they I think the professors really set those expectations with you in the syllabus and on the first yeah. week they'll let you know you know this is what I'm expecting um, and they'll usually give you a grade breakdown as well or a, or a kind of a their distribution of, of how students typically do in that course um, and that you give you an idea of 
of where you might be finishing. Another big thing about um, going into university is academic integrity. So making sure that you're citing your sources. Um, in high school, it might have been a little bit more lenient about using different types of sources. Um, we have to make sure that we're using scholarly sources. So journal articles, um, making sure that they're um, they have a lot of references and that they're of good quality to make sure that you're make, producing the best quality of work possible. Um, there are um, some late penalties. I'm not sure about in high school. Um, they, the late penalties might have been a little bit more uh, softer, um, but definitely in university, the late penalties and assignment deadlines are a little bit more strict. So you have to be uh, aware by making sure that you're proactive rather than reactive about these. Mm -hmm. Um, I've noticed a couple questions related to uh, uh, field courses in labs, and I was thinking maybe Erica, you could you could talk about. I know ERS has a, has a couple of good field courses, and maybe give some options or share your experience uh, with those types of classes. Yeah, definitely. Um, so the one field course that ERS students, as well as Gem, um, and a few of the other programs in environment will have to take is ERS two hundred, which is Intro to Field Ecology. Um, that is a mandatory field course for everybody. It has both an in-class lecture function, well online now, as well as some in-field outside like labs that you'll work through with people in your class and a TA. Um, ERS field courses, there are quite a few of them. They are, all field courses are generally only offered in the spring term um, and they do cost generally do cost a little bit extra on top of your regular tuition. Um, and these, the field course, specific field courses do happen. So you're outside every day, you're doing work, you're learning specific like skills to work in the field. Um, labs will be, so the lab for ENBS 200, for example, is a smaller class within like a subsection, kind of like a tutorial. So it's a subsection of your lecture. So there's a smaller group of people. It'll be with uh, one TA, which is generally a grad student. So you'll have one TA and maybe 20 people in the rest of your class. And you'll work with that group to do some stuff in the field. Some interesting field courses I've taken are ERS 340 and ERS 341, which are both focused on restoration ecology. Um, you can, depending on the field course, sometimes you get to go on small field trips. So you'll go... Um, up north to a specific site for a few days, or maybe you'll do on a day trip to a restoration site that a conservation area in the Waterloo region is working on. Um, so it's a, it, they're really cool. If you have the opportunity to take field courses, I highly recommend um, because they are a great experience and you learn a lot of hands-on skills from them. Bennett, did I did I hit the points? I think you nailed it. I think that gives a good people a good uh, idea of, of maybe what to expect and. Um, maybe not in their first year, but in their second year when they get a little bit more options for those. Awesome. Sweet. Love it. Okay. Let's see what else we, what other good questions we have? Um, we have a question here about, uh, about transferring into a different program. And I know that's we're a little bit early uh, in the process to start thinking about that, but, um, uh, maybe, maybe, uh, Connor or someone could talk about uh, what that process might look like if you're not super happy with what you got or or what are the options could be. Maybe just just for yeah. So yeah, so um, one thing I would definitely say is um, once again, contact your academic advisor. Um, if you're looking at um, switching into a different program, I definitely contact that academic advisor to let them know and then they can talk about different prereqs that are um, required for both the current program of study and the um, next program of study that you're needing to train, or you are looking to transfer into to make sure that you're not delaying your graduation. Nice, nice. Okay. Um, maybe we can quickly jump into some program specific stuff. I know we had a question uh, about geomatics. Um, and maybe Bell, you can talk just just briefly, maybe a minute or so about uh, the workload in that first year, or maybe a quick tip for success. Oh yeah. Um. So 
Geomatics workload is very variable. So uh, in first year, I believe you still have to take CS 115 or 135 and 116 or 136. And then you have on top of that some of your GIS, Geomatics courses and Geography courses. So in terms of workload, definitely your CS courses are a lot heavier because they have um, weekly assignments. And uh, if you are not familiar with coding or anything along those lines, you're going to probably struggle a bit more, but definitely doable all of your courses. And um, I would say your big tip is to currently it's online. So I would allot some time every single day to go through all your lectures, let's say, from Monday to Friday, you have five courses. Each day you focus on one course and then you go through all your course material and do not fall back because once you fall back, it's really hard to catch up. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. Uh, and I know I singled out geomatics there and, and we are getting some questions about all the programs in terms of the workload. I think that questions might be best to save for later just so we can hit some maybe uh, faculty specific stuff here. Um, so maybe in the B stand, well, we can get all of our all of our reps here to talk a little bit more about what how they found that transition to be into the first year of the program. Um, we can jump back into uh, a co op question. I saw one about interviews and um, and when kind of how those work and, and when those those typically are. Maybe some some tips for success. Uh, I guess Connor, you might be the best person to defer to. I'm, I'm also happy to talk a bit about it if, if you if you if you want to take a break. Yeah, for sure. I'll. How about I start it off and you finish it? And see if I missed any points. Okay. Um, so one thing I'd like to say is always be confident, and any experience is a good experience. So when you're presenting yourself to an employer, even if it's a volunteer position that maybe you did one day or an afternoon, it's still great experience and if it is if it's meaningful to you and it shows that you are organized you're um dedicated you're hard working i'd say just make sure that you're able to um bring the best out of it because um another thing employers really like is showing someone or seeing someone that's really passionate about something if they see that passion and they're like whoa this guy really likes this or this girl likes this um, um they're really into um this thing i wonder if they'd be like that about our company so like it it, it really goes a long way so always remember positive um, passionate and um just i think experience is a good experience yeah i would definitely add that um you know co-op for most of you i think won't, won't start until your second year and while it's a very daunting idea to, to be coming up on um you know if there's one thing you can concretely do in your first year to, to set yourself up for success and that is that is filled that resume, join your program society, join the Environment Student Society, get involved as much as you can, because um, that'll set you up really nicely for your most likely to be two way um, when you really have to start applying and, 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 and really worrying about the nitty gritty. But right now it's definitely all about setting yourself up for success then. OK, uh, I guess we'll keep it moving then. Um, I think there's two more questions I think it'd be really good to answer before we wrap up. Um, so number one, um, with uh, textbooks, referring to textbooks, um, is it best to, when, when is the best time to, to buy them before the class starts or should we wait until the class, uh, maybe after the first week, what's better, online textbooks or hard copies? Um, maybe Matthew, could you talk to this one? You haven't uh, had too much to say so far. Are you comfortable with 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 speaking to textbooks and strategies for success there? Matthew uh, Flanders. I guess it could be either one of you. Do you, do you hear what I said? You good? You want to talk a bit about textbooks? Hello? 
Okay, maybe I'll just jump in then. <laughs> yeah, you, um, ju you jump in. Uh, so it's for textbooks, my, in my personal experience, uh, I would recommend waiting until one, you've seen the syllabus, and two, maybe even gotten, oh, his mic's gone, okay. It's all right, I'll, I'll handle this one. Um, wait until you kind of get a feel for how the class is going to be run. Because there's some professors that will list the textbook on the syllabus, and then they won't really use it that much. Um, and there's some that will use it religiously, and you, like, you'll have reading quizzes based off the content. Um, so I definitely say hold off um, on buying them for maybe about, about a week until you get a feel for the course. Um, in terms of online versus versus a hard copy, I think it really depends on how you learn as a student. Um, you know, I, I'm someone that doesn't really need to have that, that physical highlight to, to get the information in my brain, and, and I find it easy to, to categorize the information um, on uh online but if you know if you're someone that really needs to have it physical i would say go go that direction you kind of got to ask yourself how you learn what the best way uh, uh you learn to be i saw someone in the chat say they already bought their textbooks that's okay i don't mean to say it's a bad thing to buy your textbooks early um it's just uh um you might end up, end up meeting them but you they're always a good resource to have because they're always going to contain extra information and, and help you study um and you can also sell them at the end of the year which i strongly recommend uh, doing to kind of recuperate some of those costs my mic is good now and i agree i agree ben good job i couldn't have said it better myself okay um so i think we have time for about one more maybe i'll, I'll make a big one so we can get a little more serious on it um a lot of people have questions uh, specifically about uh, about minors and you know what it takes to get a minor and how to go about doing that, especially um, certain programs. So uh, I know Lindsay, you're doing a minor. If you wanted to maybe talk about the required requirements or how to best go about getting more information on specific minors, I can also speak to it too with my econ. But you can start us off. Amazing, I can definitely start us off. So yes, I am doing a minor in anthropology and a collaborative design specialization. So if you're looking to get a minor, again, a great resource is your academic advisor. They are a wealth of knowledge and will be able to help you out with all the requirements. Another great resource um, is if you, there's a website that you can go to the, the name is escaping me right now, but if someone else knows it and could throw the it in the chat, calendar? that would be awesome. The course calendar, that's it. I'll find the link. Um, where you can go and look up all the requirements for each reminder. Thank you, Bennett. Um, and then on there, you can see how many courses you would need for each one, and then be able to start mapping that out with your degree plan to really customize what you're looking to do. Yeah. If anyone else wants to add anything, please jump in. Thank you. When you're just for like the minors, I know for me, um, I've had like a few issues with minors. Just be flexible with the courses you're taking. Sometimes they're not offered in the specific terms. Sometimes you might not be able to take a specific course. So if you really do want that minor, like be open to taking courses that maybe you aren't as interested in because um, just be like really flexible with what you want to get those eight to 10 courses that you need to get that specific minor. I'll add on a bit as well. Uh, so when taking minors in the past, I think it was a little bit rough there. Maybe okay. try again. All right, I'll try, I'll try that one more time. I have to go back and forth plugging my headphones in and out. So you can you can double count courses, but you can't triple count courses. So be careful if you're trying to get more than one more than one minor or multiple things. Uh, yeah, that's my orientation. Uh, I just want to jump in a little bit more. So uh, a lot of you guys are talking about minors, but um, there's a thing where. Uh, not all programs can get every minor and so for example for me I can only get my computing option and not like a CS minor and um, you also want to look into your specializations so there are a lot of other choices to add on to your degree I would look into all of those as well if you are looking to you know spice up your degree somehow spicy <laughs> spicy <laughs> okay 
Another another point I'll just add is in my first year, I was really stressed about trying to get as many minors as possible. And in if anyone's in knowledge integration specifically, we have a lot of electives. So it's it's really daunting at first, but take your time, explore what you're interested in. It is never too, yeah, you have time. Don't stress, you'll figure it out. You're all I'm doing sure great. I think the time to declare a minor is after, at the end of your 2B. So for, I don't know, so for, I know for EB, that's after your second summer. So you really got a long time, but um, definitely if you're thinking about it, talk to your academic advisor early because you may need to move some things around. Um, and to make it all work, but definitely possible and super fun. OK. Do you think we have time for one more Watts or do you want to wrap it up? <clears throat> I want to say we can go probably to 1225 and then we'll take, take the last five minutes for wrap up here. OK, let's let's do, so let's more do minutes. Let's do one more. Um, Uh, maybe I can do this one that just came up in the chat about working during the school year. Connor, I know you have had some jobs on campus. Uh, maybe you could talk a bit about working during the school year, but also some of the opportunities that may exist when we come back to campus. Yeah, for sure. So currently, uh, a couple of opportunities. I was just recently a front desk assistant at Waterloo Residences. So I applied through Leeds, which was actually a part of our um, trivia question a couple of days ago or a few days ago. So when you go to leads.uwaterloo.ca, that provides you um, a variety of opportunities to find um, ways to get into volunteer roles as well as um, uh, paid positions to um, kind of have a part time job on campus. I know of um, a couple other buddies of mine. They have um, gotten jobs in uh, the University Shops Plaza. They found um, positions as a teaching assistant. So when you're in your upper years, you are allowed to um, um, apply to some first year level courses that you can um, um, assist with. So there's a variety of opportunities from academic to even helping out with the residents or even just finding an off campus uh, part time job. But definitely um, before considering that, I just make sure that you're really considering your workload and making sure that you're not overworking yourselves because um, your mental health and your physical health and well-being is the top priority when at university. Awesome. All right, well, I think that, that'll bring us to the end of the questions. I just want to mention one more that we saw that I know is going to get answered later in the week. Uh, why is the banana the mascot for the faculty of environment? Um, you're going to figure that out on Wednesday, on Monday, Monday, right? ENV wrap up. Um, so make sure you tend to that if you're wondering why I'm wearing a banana suit and what the significance of this guy is. Um, but with that, I'll, I'll throw it back to the watch to, to wrap it all up for us. Uh, Matt, I think, Matt, I think you're muted. muted. Yeah, I am muted. That was my first time doing it. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that was all the questions we have time for. Um, we hope we, we uh, provided some guidance. We're uh, a little bit useful uh, for all of you. Uh, if you have any other questions uh, throughout the remainder of uh, orientation week, uh, feel free to send them to the Banana Stand channel. We're asked them during the live Banana Stand sessions that are from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern or 9 p.m. to 12 a.m. All right, just uh, so please remember to connect with your color team to complete the remaining um, remainder of your challenges. Also, um, update with GeoGuessr and Trivia for today. It, it's a little bit late, sorry about that. So I'll be posting them by 12.30 p.m. Um, also, our social media contest is still running uh, where you can um, have a chance to win a Faculty of Environment Vintage Swag Package along with um, a $25 W Store gift card. So remember uh, to apply, you must follow the Waterloo Instagram account or Waterloo Environment Orientation Instagram account, which is ENV at or ENV Orientation. Um, I believe it's in the chat. Um, you should post a photo of how you're preparing for the semester or uh, of your orientation experience, either on your um, grid or on your story. Um, and then remember to please um, DM us um, your su submission so we make sure that we can see it. Um, and then if you're selected as the winner, um, you will be featured on our social media page as well as um, the winner will be announced at tomorrow night's event. So 
make sure you tune in. Awesome. So that is all for today. Thank you all so much for coming out to our live event. Remember to mark your calendars for our final live event, which is tomorrow, M wrap up, and it is happening from 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern on Microsoft Teams. You'll be able to find the link on Portal as usual. We hope to see you all there to officially close Environment Orientation Week 2020. So have the best day, Environment. Thank you all so much. Will we, will we be doing anything for themed costume points? If you showed up to this event in a costume for your team, if you could send us a selfie, we will count that as your points. Yep. Nice. Good to know. <laughs> Amazing. And to, to clarify what's happening in the chat, yes, the social media contest did get extended to tonight. Great. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, guys.